All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our one o'clock briefing. Welcome to uh, viewers here and watching remotely. Our briefing this afternoon is called Climate Change, Scientists Tap Nature, Space, and Society. We have three excellent speakers today. They are Thomas Crowther, Assistant Professor of Environmental Science at ETH Zurich, Laura Duncanson, Assistant Professor at the University of Maryland, College Park, Matto Mildenberger, Assistant Professor of Political Science at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And also in the audience, we have the organizers of this event and the session that will be featured at the meeting, Marianne Lucien, International Communications Officer at ETH Zurich, and Victoria Iverson, International Relations Officer also at ETH Zurich. So we will get started. All right. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, so I'm Tom, and yeah, I think the video is going so perfect. Can everyone hear me? Is the thing working? Great. So I'm going to be introducing a lot of numbers here, and I'm going to kick off with a big one. Um, so 400 billion. That's actually the number of trees that scientists previously expected is, existed on our planet until a couple of years ago when we actually showed that they'd got the scale completely, completely wrong. This number is actually closer to about 3 trillion trees. Besides that headline figure, this has transformed our understanding of the, the scale of the global forest system, which is our, our most effective weapon in the fight against climate change. But it's also our most poorly understood weapon. Each year, we emit about 10 gigatons of carbon into the, into the atmosphere. That's like 27,000 Empire State buildings of carbon. And we've increased the, the, the atmospheric budget by about 300 gigatons. Project Drawdown is a company that lists the most effective climate change strategies. And they've listed uh, effective res refrigeration management across the world as one of the best strategies to take down 89 gigatons from that 300. If we all converted to a plant-only diet, that would be 66 gigatons we'd save. But in contrast, we have no idea if global forest restoration could store 10 or 110 gigatons, so it's really far down on the list of priorities. Addressing this uncertainty is the goal of our new lab. Uh, in recent decades, satellites have transformed our understanding of the biosphere, but it's very difficult for them to see below the canopy surface, so they can't get information about the biodiversity and, and, and aspects of the carbon storage that we can, uh, we can see with ground source data. So in the last year, we've developed this new lab at ETH Zurich, and it's based on an entirely bottom-up approach. Instead of using satellites, we build our models from the bottom up, based on millions of observations from people on the ground. And using this new empirical approach, we can use artificial intelligence and machine learning to extrapolate this information, and then we use satellites to scale those observations to get unprecedented insights into the scale of the global forest system and global soil carbon storage. With this unique bottom-up approach, we show that Along with the three trillion trees that currently exist, there's room for an additional 1.2 trillion trees outside of urban areas and outside of agricultural areas. This also helps us to understand how much carbon could be stored in those trees. Unfortunately, I can't share that exact number with you at the moment because the paper is currently in review, but hopefully that number will be coming out quite soon. Um, but I, what I can confirm is that that total global quantitative information uh, number is, it sets global forest restoration far, far higher than any of the other climate change solutions listed today, considerably higher. Using the same approach, we're also starting to understand how much carbon is stored in the soil, and we show that the vast majority of soil carbon is in the high latitude Arctic and subarctic areas. But as these ecosystems warm, they're emitting about 1.5 gigatons of carbon per year. That's accelerating the rate of climate change by about 12 to 17 percent. So managing those ecosystems could be, again, one of our more effective strategies in the fight against climate change. At this conference, we're actually launching our, our global biodiversity data sets so that ecologists all around the world can use this information freely and generate their own models. This global information is valuable for us to be able to set effective global scale targets. And it's also critical for us to be able to identify the most effective regions to restore ecosystems and protect soils. Three years on from that initial discovery of, of the three trillion trees, the UN's billion tree campaign has been converted into the UN's trillion tree campaign, and they've already restored about 17 billion trees in high carbon capture parts of the world. Thanks very much. So that's me finished. Great. Yeah. All right. Um, so, hi, I'm a remote sensing scientist, so I use satellite imagery to study the, the planet, and my focus is also on forest carbon. So. Tom gave a really nice introduction to the importance of forests in the global carbon cycle, and I am here to introduce some new NASA technologies that we can use to actually map forest carbon in 3D at a global scale. 
Um, so to date, if you could show the first uh, video clip, please. So to date, we have um, existing NASA technology that we can use to track deforestation from space. So you can see deforestation here. This is an area of the Brazilian Amazon um, made from Matt Hansen's group at the University of Maryland. And, uh, and you can see back into the 80s um, through to present a lot of deforestation happening. And you can track that very easily from space with passive optical imagery. You can see in the perimeter there, that's a uh, protected area. So you can see there's not deforestation happening in that protected area. The problem is that we don't have carbon numbers associated with this deforestation. So we can say, hey, we're losing forest cover, but we don't know how much carbon is actually being emitted to the atmosphere. And that's where these new technologies come in. So we're going to actually do a live demo of this. This is a, a LIDAR instrument. It stands for Light Detection and Ranging. And we're going to do a 3D scan of the room. So, uh, so you'll see the type of data we're talking about. So this is not passive optical imagery. We're not taking a photo. We're actually shooting laser beams. Um, uh, they're very safe. Um, but shooting laser beams at the room to recreate a, uh, a three-dimensional uh, image. And we could use that to find the distance from the sensor to the back of the room to all of you and recreate that volume. So we're going to see the image on the screen in just a second. So it scanned. This is a Regal instrument um, donated for the press briefing. Um, and, uh, and we have similar technology we're putting up in space. So you can see there in just a second... There you all are in three dimensions. Oh, live demo. It worked so beautifully this morning, I promise. <laughs> right? Oh, there we go. And then I think it was just going full screen from there, and we can zoom around. Um, so LIDAR works by emitting laser beams and uh, measuring the distance elapsed, elapsed between the emission and the return reflected laser beam. Um, so you can see there, there you all are in three dimensions. It's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we have new technologies, two new NASA technologies that we have launched to space last fall. We have ISAT-2 that launched in September, and we have NASA's JEDI, spelled with a G, the Global Ecosystem Dynamics Investigation that I'm um, associated with, um, that launched the International Space Station in December. So I wanted to um, finish up by showing um, a clip of JEDI, if we could move to the last clip there. Um, so this is the, the instrument, so we launched to the International Space Station, as I said, and, uh, and it's essentially collecting 3D data at a much coarser resolution than what you just saw with this Regal sensor, um, but globally, so uh, everywhere that where the ISS covers, which is up to 51 degrees north. So you can see it's essentially like a, a refrigerator-sized box that we plug onto the ISS, and it shoots down these laser beams that resolves three, in three dimensions Earth's forest, and we can translate those laser returns into estimates of above-ground biomass or forest carbon. So this is essentially filling in that big carbon gap in the, in the uh, global carbon cycle. We'll now know how much carbon is stored in Earth's forest and how it's spatially distributed. So this will help us um, constrain climate models, carbon cycle models, and give important information to, uh, to forest managers. Um, the last thing I wanted to say, so JEDI launched, as I said, to the ISS. The ISS does not actually go over the poles. So north of 51 degrees latitude, we're using a second um, NASA LIDAR sensor, ISAT-2, to fill in that gap. So ISAT-2, as you might guess, is designed to study ice in 3D and track melting um, ice sheets. But uh, we can use ISAT-2 data to fill in the boreal forest. So we're going to have this complete global 3D carbon picture filled in in the next year or two. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks. So over uh, the past two decades, climate scientists like my colleagues here uh, have done a really good job at understanding the local impacts of climate change. Um, and economists have also made great strides in understanding what the economic consequences of climate change will be for communities across the world. Um, but the climate crisis is also a political issue. Um, and to, to think about how to address climate change, we need to have an understanding about the conditions under which we'll act, and that's going to depend on public risk perceptions, public beliefs about climate change, and also public policy preferences, both for climate policies as well as energy policies. Um, but to date, our understanding of these really important political factors have often been limited to state or, or national level polls here in the US and around the world. Um, so my research team specializes in creating very high resolution, spatially resolved estimates of what the public thinks about climate change. Um, and today, for the first time, we're releasing data that shows what Republicans and Democrats in the U.S. think about climate change at 
each state and all the way down to each congressional district in the U.S. To, to try and really understand what are the political incentives that elected officials here in the U.S. have when trying to make sense of how to act on climate change. And our, our data shows significant um, convergence and divergence. Uh, so we do find that a majority of Republicans and Democrats think that global warming is happening. Um, we find a, a much larger amount of support for various climate policies amongst the Republican base in a number of states and congressional districts than we might think from uh, some of the rhetoric we see from political elites. Um, but we do find at the same time some divergences. There's a, a very large gap between whether Democrats and Republicans believe they've experienced the impacts of climate change, where the partisan lens that people have all the way down to the congressional district really shapes what people think they've experienced at that local scales. Um, and we also find uh, and present some interesting data showing that in every congressional district across the country, Republicans and Democrats support funding research into renewables and taking certain types of action to regulate and manage carbon pollution. All of our data um, is visualized and available as part of an interactive tool um, that you should have access to as part of your press packet. Um, but is also available on the link that's uh, on the screen. And this interactive tool lets you explore what Republicans and Democrats at each congressional district and in each state think about climate change across a variety of different climate risk perceptions, climate beliefs, and policy preferences, and really gives us the, the most high-resolution images and data that we have on how people across this country at local scales think about the climate crisis. Thank you, including for the demos. And we will now open the floor to questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand. We'll bring a mic to you. And kindly state your name and affiliation before your question. <coughs> All right, so first question will be in the back in the red. Yeah, hi. I had a question directed to the person who's doing uh, political and policy feedbacks. Uh, Is the mic working? <coughs> I'm not sure. Hello, can you hear me? There we go, yes, yeah. Can. Okay. Um, so. Is there a correlation between what you're seeing in these, on this map and educational levels, how informed people are about climate change? I see that most of, its, most of the deniers are in Mississippi, Arkansas, uh, Alabama. And can we have your affiliation, please? Thank you. Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists on the editor who handles climate change. Thank you. Yeah, yeah um, it actually tends to be in a lot of political science research that as people become more educated, they become more sophisticated consumers of political information. Um, and in fact, they can become more sophisticated consumers of anti-science political information on the right and pro-science political information on the left. Um, it's often the case that some of the individuals who promote or, or sort of believe strongly in a variety of climate skeptical beliefs are quite educated um, because they, they tend to be better off, more partisan, and therefore have adopted um, political beliefs in line with their um, partisan posturing. Um, so there is a bit of a gradient, um, but it's not absolute. And often, some of the people who know most about climate science or have the most climate knowledge are actually um, climate skeptics. So it tends to bifurcate. People yeah. are more educated. They tend to be either, well, tends to reinforce their existing opinion. That's right. Question here. Yeah, uh, David Helvarg. I'm an author and freelancer. Uh, two questions, quick ones. Mato, did you find any geographical correlation, like are people in Florida and California who are being hit harder, having any different attitude of whether they've experienced it, or is it strictly partisan? Um, so you do see some variation. Um, so for instance, it's certainly the case that um, some Republicans in Florida tend to have stronger climate beliefs and concern about climate change than Republicans in other parts of the country. Um, but that pales in comparison to the partisan lens, which really shapes how people interpret whether or not they've experienced the effects of climate change. Great for us. Um, and Thomas, what you were earlier saying, um, so is it 17 to 18 percent of measurable greenhouse gases now being traceable to the taiga and the tundra and the boreal forest burning? Yeah, not necessarily burning. Essentially, as we, as we warm the planet, yeah, we, if you imagine humans, we're emitting like 10 a year. As we warm the planet, there's loads and loads and loads of microorganisms in the soil, and particularly in the cold areas, that those organisms are just sitting there quietly sort of chilled out. 
as you warm up those organisms, they as we all would, they start to respire more. And the more they respire, the more carbon comes out of the, into the atmosphere. And so it's, at, it's, it's a global phenomenon. It's just that the vast majority of carbon is in the high latitudes. And they're also the places where warming is so having such a big impact that, yeah, it's accelerating. Currently, we're seeing acceleration of about 12 to 17 percent. It's essentially equivalent to having another US on the planet. Hi, uh, my name is Vijay Shankar. I'm a freelance science journalist. So I have a question to um, uh, Laura and Thomas. So I was wondering if you were able to uh, identify any hotspots uh, in, in the areas that you studied where you could assess or correlate any, any socioeconomic behavior of that region which, which make them or which drive uh, deforestation. So, uh, because I'm curious, you know, if we know what drives and what makes them uh, go ahead cutting trees, uh, this could come up with any mitigation uh, solutions or any alternative uh, economic ideas, that's why. I, I can't speak to that yet because our mission just launched in December, so we, we're, we ha haven't even started collecting science data. So we'll be assigning those carbon values to deforestation uh, over the next few years, and then we will have answers for you from a carbon perspective. From a socioeconomic perspective, in terms of the drivers of deforestation, do you have a comment, John? Yeah, sure. So, so we, we've been um, comparing our data sets with, with socioeconomic information, and Amazingly, we actually find no correlations, but we do know undoubtedly that the vast majority of deforestation at the moment is happening in the tropical regions, in the, uh, often the countries that are socioeconomically more deprived. So it's, it's, but that's not to say that these are, the, it, these are the parts of the world that are damaging the ecosystem the most. It's just that in the Northern Hemisphere, we already did it 100 years ago. And so now, you know, through as, as those countries become more economically developed, they also use their resources a lot more, and so there's a lot of you know, deforestation in those parts of the world. So definitely focusing on restoring, uh, or sort of conserving and restoring ecosystems in those parts of the world is a high priority, because it's also where the most biodiversity and the most carbon storage is, I guess. So my second question uh, is, um, is this particular concept, the following concept, uh, being considered by your team, like invasive species, and the role of invasive species, um, especially in the northern hemisphere because of the warming temperatures that could you know, bring invasive species from different countries and that uh, have, or that have the potential to, to greatly impact the forest cover and the socioeconomy around forests. So I was wondering if uh, this is under consideration. Yeah, my mom, I think, yeah, so we, we actually, interesting you say that, in, a, in about six months, I'm hoping we're going to have finished this, this product, but we have a first global model of invasive, invasive tree species around the world, and it shows that it's all around the, it's all, it's all around the edges, so it's where, it's where you're close to, the, close to cities or close to the ocean that you see the highest amount of invasive species, but we've also seen that the traits of those species Globally, there's a, there's a slight trend towards invasive species are always faster growing, which also means they're faster cycling. So they, they, both, they, they take up carbon very rapidly, but they also mean that they, they support a microbial community in the soil that is dominated by bacteria. And that means they spew out carbon a lot more than the slower growing trees that capture and trap carbon for a long time. So there's a slight trend. I would say globally it's a very slight trend and we're still exploring which biogeographic patterns this is strongest in, but globally it tends to be that cycling happens faster and that means less carbon is stored in those ecosystems. But it's early days, yeah. So question here and then we'll come over to Robin. Yeah, hello, uh, this is Purti and I'm a science journalist uh, with a media portal called Research Matters from India. Uh, you mentioned about uh, the global biodiversity data set and uh, India being one, you know, housing one of the biodiversity hotspots in the Western Ghats. I was just wondering what this data set contains and you know, if you can brief a little more about it. Right, so yeah, it's called Global, well, we have two data sets that we're gonna be releasing. One's called Global Forest Biodiversity Initiative and it's about 1.2 million locations with about, one, with about 30 million observations of you know, foresters standing on the ground looking at a tree telling you what it is, how big it is, and, um, and what species it is. And with all that information, we're actually collaborating a lot with, 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 uh, with Laura on several of the projects that involve the remote sensing side. But 
with that information, we have, a, I, I think it's in the order of several thousand from India. It, it's all of the tropical regions are massively underrepresented. We've got unbelievable amounts of data from the higher latitudes. We want more and more from the tropics, but we're still in the order of like a few tens of thousands across the tropics. But it is direct observations where a human being has assessed the situation and given it. And so that is, it gives us a nice feeling of confidence that we, we can sort of believe in that data. And we, did, we haven't needed an algorithm to, to, to come up with it. It's measured there. And so, yeah, we, we then build models that sort of combine all those data sets. So that, that's the global forest one. And that's, that's nice for anything about, you know, invasive species or, 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 or the biomass of forests or, the, or how they're changing. But we're also uh, at the later stages of developing a very similar one called the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative. And that's got uh, fewer observations, but many, 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 many more species. Uh, and that's quite interesting as well, because while I think the global forest one is useful to, to go along with satellite uh, observations and to, to you know, build in a different angle, the soil is completely unknown. And so everything we're finding is an entirely new global development. And again, it, we've just had two papers accepted in Nature this, this month. One is on the global biodiversity of soil animals, and one is the we've mapped the the global microbiome of the the the, wo the wood wide web. If you've heard of this, the mycorrhizal fungi, and so both of them are hopefully coming out in the next month. Question over here with Robin and this row. Thank you, Robin Williams, Australian Broadcasting Corporation. Stefan Lewandowski, who's now at Bristol University, professor of psychology, was bef before in Perth. Um, was actually at this conference and he gave some figures which suggested that uh, if you look at the overall population, say of deniers versus those who accept the science, the deniers are in a much smaller number but much louder. Is that the impression that you get from your figures? So certainly it's the case that uh, large majorities of the public in most countries, um, often very large majorities, both believe that climate change is happening, want to see action to solve it, and want to see that action immediately. Um, I think what's interesting about these figures is that we can show how um, the rhetoric that we might see from uh, senior Republicans who have taken a very consistently anti-climate set of positions over the last decade um, masks quite a bit of spatial variation and residual support amongst Republican Party members in many parts of the country. And it's not just a story of seeing uh, pro-climate Republicans in California or New York, um, but that even in some of the most conservative districts in the country, there still are you know, majority supports for aggressive funding for renewable R&D um, and concern over how the climate is changing. Um, so I definitely think that the, the profile and the uh, status that climate denialism and climate skeptic arguments have within popular debates um, overstate the percentage of people who hold those positions. Um, but I, I think data like this that really visualizes and shows what the distribution of beliefs are is hopefully a bit of an antidote to that, to start reflecting on and, and showing what the true distribution of beliefs among the public is. Could I possibly just add to that? So I literally just published a paper with Stefan Lewandowski um, on essentially people's shifting beliefs around polar bear health and survival under climate change. And essentially in that paper, we criticized equally the, the extreme end of climate denial and the extreme end of climate um, people who believe climate concern, yeah. And, and really it was just sort of highlighting the, the breadth of people's opinion on the topic. But, from my experience and all of our all of the authors' experience, we got destroyed. Again, we, we believe we were giving a completely even even argument, and, and and we definitely criticized both sides, and we got demolished by the climate change deniers. But no feedback at all from the people who believe. So that's just my little two cents. Yeah. Okay. Have a question? Okay, great. Uh, John Kerry, freelance, read a lot for PNAS. Uh, Thomas, is the clear implication of your new numbers that forest restoration should become a larger part of the overall climate strategy? And two, do we even know if soils are a sink or a source? One, definitely, definitely yes. I think at the moment it's, 
it, you know, IPCC says we need a billion extra hectares. That's great, but there's there's nothing quantitative to say what that will do, how much carbon that will capture, what will be there. What we can confirm is that, again, if you go by the sort of, I think Project Drawdown is a really great program. They've got a list of all the sort of climate change solutions. What we're finding is that forest restoration in the available land, you know, not cutting out any a, any any agricultural land, not planting over the whole of Paris. If we just used it, like areas that are available for restoration, again, we don't talk about whether they're politically, you know, if they're own ownership issues. I'm just saying if the world magically all got our act together and restored where it's possible, <laughs> it would be considerably higher than the next best climate change solution. So definitely yes. As for the soils being a source or a sink, uh, we don't yet have absolute consensus, but I, from all the evidence of the research that I've done, I would be extremely confident that it is a source, is turning into a source. Every single perturbation we do, warming definitely, nutrient enrichment normally in most in the lower latitudes generally leads to increased carbon storage, but in high latitudes where you've got massive carbon stocks, you do see slight proportional losses of carbon even in response to nutrient enrichment. And elevated CO2 is still not having a big uptake. So I think generally most of the global change drivers are leading to losses from the soil, so it's very worrying. But I do think it's also quite optimistic because preventing many of these changes just means get some plants on it, get some cover crops, stop tilling it. There's effective strategies that we can do to sort of protect those soils. Um, yeah. Okay. We have a question here in the second row, third row. Yeah. yeah, hi, sorry, I had another question. So it's great to see, you know, there's a lot of initiatives going around like planting more forests and, you know, uh, including the UN supporting initiatives like this, but then, uh, what's your view on the ill-informed uh, measures taken by some countries where they are converting other ecosystems like, say, grasslands, which are equally important like forests, to, to you know, artificially grow forests because somebody said trees are good? So w what is your opinion as ecologists, biologists in, you know, in, 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 in such things? Do you want to go first? Or? You take that one. Okay. <laughs> All right, yeah, I mean, I think w I'm sure we both entirely agree on this. It, it's you know, absolutely wrong. That's the reason we do these, this, these global models is to try and reveal which ecosystems should be a forest and which ones are and which ones could be. Restoring in naturally diverse grasslands is devastating, not only for the soil carbon storage, but also for biodiversity. And there's loads of examples of it gone devastatingly wrong in, in Europe and China and all sorts of places where trees have been planted in the wrong soils and then they, they don't even survive. And, or, or they've been planted and they destroy local biodiversity identifying the regions to target is is critical. I'm all for restoration and natural regeneration and planting, but it has to be scientifically informed and it needs these global maps to be able to do that. Yeah, I would probably add to that. I think that for a lot of the restoration, um, we still have this, this carbon gap. We don't know how much carbon is actually being amassed by these forests, and we don't know how much carbon is actually being released through deforestation. So until we have those really rich, global, consistent carbon numbers, a lot of this is going to be somewhat speculative, uh, based on good science, but good science that's been derived from very limited data. So hopefully in the next couple of years, we'll have a much richer response to questions like that. Yeah, I'm wondering if you know who's doing or is there a major science look at blue carbon in terms of mangrove seagrass as the idea of commercial expansion of algal farming and if there's any real database being collected at this point? Yeah, um, NASA has a, a large blue carbon program that um, some of my colleagues at NASA Goddard are, are very focused on uh, mapping and monitoring mangroves in particular, which are these incredibly carbon important um, ecosystems. I don't personally study mangroves, but th that is a large push, um, certainly within NASA, to, to try and automate that and monitor it at a global scale. So I'm happy to put you in touch with some of those people. Uh, yeah, I was curious. Um, you were talking about uh, you know, the benefits of natural regeneration, but given that we seem to be living in an era when uh, exotic species seem to be very aggressive at coming in and wiping out the native species, how can you get the natural regeneration that you want? Well, there's multiple ways. I mean, I, I honestly support all everyone's approaches, to be honest. I think there's huge debate over tree planting or natural regeneration or whatever. I'm I love tree planting because it speeds up the process and it gets humans involved and that, you know, that getting people involved is like the key to having, you know, a, a broader impact. But also when you allow, if you just fence off an area, take the sheep off, 
in most parts of the world, as long as the soil's not been completely destroyed, natural, natural forests and, and ecosystems, well, in places that should be forested, natural <laughs> forests will regenerate. Um, of course, there's always gonna be the issue with invasive species, and it's not natural because we've changed the climate, and there's all sorts of issues, but the point is, if you just allow ecosystems, if you let them alone, they will undoubtedly recover, given enough time. And if you can, and if people are up for speeding that along, that's great. I think that's fine too. Question here. Hi, uh, Mathieu Perrault from La Presse in Montreal. Uh, I, I have a question for uh, Matteo. Um, what is, uh, is there anything in your data that can um, help us think about the primary system, the congressional primaries, or maybe not the average person is voting? Uh, yeah, so one of the, the benefits of, so, so previously we've released similar estimates, but of the general population in each congressional district, for instance. Um, and of course that masks differences between primary voters in the Republican and Democratic Party. I um, mean, one of the benefits of having this spatial resolution and high resolution data on what Democrats and Republicans think is that it gives us more insight into what the incentives that elected officials may face in sort of political primaries. Um, and, and that's where I think we're seeing evidence that um, you know, many congressional Republicans may be able to have slightly stronger climate preferences or, or adopt stronger climate rhetoric than they do and still be in line with the majority of Republicans in their districts. And so there may be more latitude for individuals inside the Republican Party to take more aggressive stances um, on climate. And, and I'd mention that um, you know, our research team uh, of folks um, here um, at Yale University, Santa Barbara, Utah State, and also uh, the University of Montreal, we've also released uh, similar maps of climate opinion in Canada uh, down to the riding level um, to, to also visualize and make sense of the distribution of beliefs there. Um, and that's also available on that data visualization data visualization link that's on your on your form. I have a question for, for you, Laura. As you get that data back from the laser missions, how would it, you know, uniquely inform different forest managers, to, what, depending on the kind of data you get back, what are some of those different scenarios? What do they look like? Um, yeah, so I think one of the most powerful things about doing this from space is that we're collecting data totally independent of any sort of political or socioeconomic barriers. So, um, and, and all NASA data is completely available to the public, completely public no matter where in the world you are. Um, so for sort of um, rich countries that have really mature forest inventories, they have a pretty good sense of how much carbon's there and, uh, and they can already integrate it into whichever forest management systems they want. But for uh, the global south primarily, it's, you know, there are all these data gaps, which Tom talked about even for the biodiversity data sets, right? We don't have a very rich sense of how much carbon is where and how it's spatially distributed. So um, we're, we don't make um, recommendations for like which forest management strategy people will take, but we're giving the information to the entire world and saying, hey, here's how much carbon is in your forests. Here's how it's spatially distributed. Um, use this to, to manage them however best you know, you feel you would. So, um, yeah, certainly if you wanted to take a carbon market type approach, you could use these as inputs to a carbon market because it does add that sort of that quantitative value on the carbon in the forest. Um, but there are many other different ways of managing forests as well. So if you're just looking at, uh, you know, traditional sustainable forestry, um, you can track the, the carbon through time um, of, you know, your sort of replanting in your, your forestry holes and such. So. We're essentially just giving the data to the world and then hopefully it'll help. We don't have any, any, any more any I just comments? wanted to add, at, at, at one point in the, in the press briefing material, we, we included a, a value for the amount of carbon that could be stored in regeneration. If possible, I'd actually discourage anybody from using, if anyone does plan on writing anything up, don't give an exact value because that was a very, it was a preliminary study, which is, it, it is out there, but we're now at much further stages and we, we can actually confirm that it's, it's way off. It's, it, it was going in the right direction, but it's wrong. And so the, that value is actually under review now. And so it'll be available in, within a couple of months. So. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. And thanks for the demos. Thank you for a wonderful briefing. Okay. Okay.